Hey guys, this is Vyom Joshi with Superior North. Welcome back to my channel. Today I will be talking about an approach that Benjamin Graham outlined in chapter 40 of the security analysis. That chapter is about capitalization structure. Benjamin Graham says that in a speculatively capitalized enterprise, the common stockholders benefit or have the possibility of benefit at the expense of the senior security holders. The common stockholder is operating with a little of his own money and a great deal of the senior security holders' money. As between him and them, it is a case of heads I win, tails you lose. This strategic position of the common stockholder with relatively small commitment is an extreme form of what is called trading on the equity. Using another expression, he may be said to have a cheap call on the future of the enterprise. So what Benjamin Graham is trying to explain is that if you're optimistic about an industry and that industry, let's say, has two companies, one of the companies is highly leveraged and the other it has good fundamentals, then it's better for you to invest in the company that is highly leveraged, primarily because when the company's revenues grow, the company's earnings are going to grow and that growth is going to be at a higher level than the growth that will be seen in the company that is not as leveraged. Let me give you an example. Let's say you have two companies, company A and company B. Company A is leveraged and has to pay $10 as its interest payments every year regardless of the company's income. Company B, on the other hand, is not leveraged at all and has to pay $0 as its interest payments. For the first year, let's say both companies make $15 as their income before interest and taxes. So after they pay out their interest obligations, company A is going to be left with $5 and company B is going to be left with $15. Now let's move forward to year two, where both companies A and B are making $20 as their income before interest and taxes. After company A pays out its interest, it's going to be left with $10 and company B on the other hand is going to be left with $20. Now if you compare the earnings from year one to year two, we can see that the company that was more leveraged, in other words, company A's earnings doubled, whereas company B just saw a growth of about 33% in its earnings. Now let's apply this concept to the steel industry. I'm speculating that the demand for steel is going to grow in the upcoming years, not only because of the infrastructure spending, but also because of the added windmills which the motors are made up of steel and then the transformers which are needed for electrification and with the added EVs that are going to be brought online it is going to tax the electrical grid and in order to meet the electrical demand utilities are going to have to put new transformers. Those transformers need steel. So overall I'm speculating that the demand for steel is going to grow hence the companies that are in the steel industry are going to see a growth in their revenue. I will be focusing on Cleveland Clips because out of all its competitors, the company had the lowest stock price. Hence, it would qualify for cheap call option that Benjamin Graham outlined. Additionally, out of all its competitors, Cleveland Clips is the most leveraged because it recently went on a buying spree where it acquired multiple companies such as AK Steel and ArcelorMittal USA. So let's dive in and review Cleveland Clips' key ratios to make sure that the company can survive for the foreseeable future. Hey guys, I'm on Morningstar looking at Cleveland Cliffs under key ratios. I'm looking at the financials. The first item on the list is the revenue. The revenue is the top line of the income statement. This is the amount of money that the company brings in via sales. Back in 2011, the company brought in about $6.8 billion. And for the trailing 12 months, that number was about $17.4 billion. When we look at the past 10 year trend, we can see that the company's revenue declined from 2011 through 2015. After that, it was range bound between $1.9 to about $2.3 billion. And recently, over the past couple of years, the company's revenue has been growing. Next, looking at the operating income. The operating income is the amount of money that's left with the company once it has paid for the cost of goods and operating expenses. In other words, operating income is what we get when we subtract cost of goods and operating expenses from the company's revenue. Back in 2011, the company's operating income was about $2.3 billion. And for the trailing 12 months, that number was about $3 billion. Over the past 10 years, there was only one year that was back in 2020 when the company's operating income was negative. Next, looking at the net income. The net income is the bottom line of the income statement. This is the amount of money that's left with the company once it has paid for the cost of goods, operating expenses, non-operating expenses, interest on its debt obligations, and taxes. Back in 2011, the company's net income was about $1.6 billion. And for the trailing 12 months, that number was about $2.2 billion. Over the past 10 years, there were a few years when the company's net income was negative. In other words, these were the years when the company reported a loss and it's not uncommon for a company in the steel industry to report losses like these. Next, looking at the dividends per share. Back in 2011, the company paid out about $0.84 cent per share as dividend and for the year 2020, it paid out about $0.06 cent per share as dividend. Over the past 10 years, the company's dividend payouts have been irregular and for three of the past 10 years, the company did not make any dividend payments. Next, looking at the shares outstanding. 
Back in 2011, the company had 141 million shares outstanding, and that number had grown to about 531 million shares for the trailing 12 months. Over the past 10 years, the company's shares outstanding number has been increasing, which tells us that the company has been doing some equity financing in order to finance its projects that it is pursuing. When a company issues more shares like these, it dilutes the existing shareholders' ownership within the company. However, in the metal sector, it's common for companies to issue more shares in order to finance its growth. Next, looking at the book value per share. The book value is what we get when we subtract the company's total liabilities from its total assets. So in other words, book value is the same as shareholders' equity. Back in 2011, the company's book value per share was about $40 per share. And for the trailing 12 months, that number was about $8 per share. There were a few years from 2014 through 2018 when the company's book value per share was negative. This means that for these years, the company had more liabilities than assets on its balance sheet. However, recently, the company's book value per share has turned positive. Next, looking at the free cash flow. The free cash flow is what we get when we subtract capital spending from the company's operating cash flow. Back in 2011, the company's free cash flow was about $1.4 billion. And for the trailing 12 months, that number was about $819 million. Over the past 10 years, there were a few years when the company's free cash flow was negative, which is fairly common for a company in this sector. Next, looking at the profitability of the company, focusing on the net margin. The net margin is the ratio of the company's bottom line to its top line, so it compares the company's net income to its revenue. Back in 2011, the company's net margin was about 23.83%, and for the trailing 12 months, that number was about 12.44%. What this means is every $100 that the company made over the past 12 months, by the time it paid for its cost of goods, operating expenses, non-operating expenses, interest on its debt obligations, and taxes, it had about $12.44 left as pure profit. Over the past 10 years, there were a few years when the company reported a negative net margin number. This is because the company reported a loss in those calendar years. Next, looking at the return on equity. The return on equity is the ratio of the company's income to its shareholders' equity. Back in 2011, the company's return on equity was about 34%, and for the trailing 12 months, that number was about 90%. The reason for this high return on equity number is because the company has a lot of liabilities. And when we look at the equation, assets being equal to liabilities plus shareholders' equity, when the company has a lot of liabilities, its shareholders' equity portion drops. So when we compare this ratio, or look at income divided by a tiny equity portion, we're bound to get these inflated return on equity numbers. Finally, looking at the interest coverage, the interest coverage is the ratio of the company's income to its interest obligations. So it gives us an idea of how many times can the company pay off its interest obligations using its income in that calendar year. For the trailing 12 months, the company's interest obligation was about nine times. Benjamin Graham, the father of value investing, preferred to only invest in securities when the company's interest coverage was five times or higher. Now let's look at the financial health of the company. Focusing on the liquidity ratios, the first item on the list is the current ratio. The current ratio compares the company's current assets to its current liabilities. Ideally, we want to see the company's current ratio to be greater than 1.0. It's even better if it's greater than 1.5. A current ratio greater than 1.0 tells us that the company has enough oxygen in its system to survive for another 12 months. Back in 2011, the company's current ratio was about 1.2 times, and for the latest quarter, it's at 2.18 times. Next, looking at the quick ratio. The quick ratio is similar to the current ratio except we disregard the inventory component. In other words, quick ratio is equal to current assets minus inventory divided by current liabilities. Ideally, we want to see the company's quick ratio to be greater than 1.0 as it tells us that the company does not have to rely on selling its inventory in order to fulfill its current liabilities. Back in 2011, the company's quick ratio was at 0.55 and for the latest quarter, it was at 0.73. Next, looking at the financial leverage. The financial leverage is the ratio of the company's total assets to its shareholders equity. A financial leverage of 1.0 tells us that all of the company's assets are financed via its shareholders equity. A high financial leverage tells us that more of the company's assets are financed via liabilities. Back in 2011, the company's financial leverage was at 2.51 and for the latest quarter, it's at 4.52. Over the past couple of years, the company's financial leverage has been decreasing. However, we can see that the company is more leveraged now than it was back in 2011. Finally, looking at the debt to equity ratio, this ratio compares the company's total debt to its shareholders' equity. Ideally, we want to see the company's debt to equity ratio to be less than 1.0. It's even better if it's less than 0.5. Back in 2011, the company's debt to equity ratio was at 0.62. And for the latest quarter, it's at 1.34. So after looking at all these four ratios, we can see that the company is liquid enough where it can survive for another 12 months. And it is more leveraged now than it was 10 years ago. Now let's compare the company's current valuation to that of the S&P 500. The S&P 500 is the aggregate of the top 500 companies in the United States. The first item on the list is the price to earnings ratio. Cleveland Cliffs' price to earnings is at 5.7, whereas S&P 500 is at 24.9.
The company's price to book is at 2.8, whereas S&P 500 is at 4.5. The company's price to sales is at 0.7, whereas S&P 500 is at 3.2. The company's price to cash flow is at 8.2, whereas S&P 500 is at 18.1. And finally, the dividend yield. Cleveland Cliffs does not have a dividend yield as it did not pay out any dividends recently. And S&P 500 has a dividend yield of 1.4%. So we can see that on all these valuation metrics, other than the dividend yield, Cleveland Cliffs is undervalued when compared to the S&P 500. In conclusion, Cleveland Cliffs seems to be a good bet for the approach that Benjamin Graham outlined in Chapter 40 of the Security Analysis. Cleveland Cliffs does not have the best fundamentals. However, the company is leveraged. So when Cleveland Cliffs sees a growth in its revenue and its net income, the common shareholders are going to benefit the most. Hey guys, that is all I had for you this week. Hopefully you found this video on the section on the security analysis and Cleveland Cliffs interesting. If you like this content, please do like, share, comment, and subscribe. And if you have any suggestions on which stock I should review next, please leave it in the comment section below. I'll greatly appreciate it. Thank you.